Or, okay. Yeah, that probably makes sense. Why would you have two bottles? Is something happening in your life? Like, I mean, one's one is water, one is coffee. I, I know. You, you mind if I connect to the um, sure, yeah, screen? Uh, yeah. Because I want to have two screens. But yeah. I don't want my notes live streamed. <laughs> Um, I probably won't try to record you since it will be on YouTube, uh, and, and then maybe I'll record uh, me. So you guys all hear that's okay? Um, so we can Out there in Twitch world? Well, I mean, I, I can still record our it's part, on. but okay. it's hard for me to record his cool. stuff. So I, I just don't. Yeah. I could, I could do it. Through Sounds there. not great for me either, but just the way it is. Show. <laughs> this is science class, by the way. Is it about colors? I, I guess so. Uh, yeah, look at her. She's she's, like, like she looks like she's Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> because of the hair? The hair, the outfit. <laughs> looking around, you know, she's, she's really got her head up more than, you know. Lexi, yeah, or uh, Christy recently had a baby, and so she's just trying to get her. Color? Color. Color, color theory. <laughs> And so yeah, right now Matt's receiving your screen and this webcam or and this camera. Yes, I am. Uh, oh yeah, just yeah, it, okay, yeah, okay, yeah okay, just okay, making sure yeah. You, it, yeah, there there is video support if you want. Okay, I can see what I need to see. Okay. So I went to iClear in New Orleans, um, and there were a couple of kind of high level thoughts I had about it. Um, you know, obviously it was, it was all machine learning. There was a little bit of neuroscience, but not much. Um, but there are a bunch of people I met who were quite interested in neuroscience inspired stuff, but there was very little at the conference. So I think it's, it's kind of a good timing for us to be applying neuroscience. Everyone I spoke to about that kind of idea were, were quite interested, in particularly when I started talking about the specifics. And so I think that that's a good, um, Thing. Um, I had uh, I I tweeted this yesterday, but or, or two days ago. But I it was like really striking to me to see how modern machine learning conferences are run versus neuroscience conferences, um, and it's it just speaks to kind of the efficiency and speed of ide this, how fast ideas are disseminated in the machine learning community versus the neuroscience community, and so some of the things. Um, uh, I'll point out here is that um, <clears throat> so every uh, so let's go to a, a schedule is kind of a typical website is not the best but um, uh, I'm sorry let's go here um, so first of all every accepted submission has a full paper that goes with it it's unlike cosine or these other neuroscience conferences. Uh, in, with cosine, you submit like a two-page abstract, but all that's there is a one-page abstract. Whereas here, everything here comes with a full thing, and you can um, there's a link to it on the note. So, so uh, these aren't necessarily published in a paper in a journal or anything. Like these are just, but this is the way they're publishing these papers. So. Yeah, so they're publishing these papers. The interesting thing is is that these are peer reviewed, uh, and before they come here, before as part of the acceptance process. Oh, part of the acceptance process. Except, so that's that's. Similar to cosine, but the way they peer review it is if you click on it, they use something called openreview.net. So all for every single paper, all the reviews are available. And these are really yeah. Why is that? Oh uh, okay, yeah, it was but somehow it, it got paused. Uh, yeah, but um Every paper has these detailed reviews available. And the way they did the review process, it's all open. Anyone can see it. Um, anyone from the community can chime in with their own reviews of the paper. So during the whole submission process, um, these are really nice reviews. And you can, as an author, you can um, respond as many times as you want to the reviewers. So uh, but now the reviews are anonymous? That everything's, anonymous yeah. Yeah. everything's anonymous. And you don't know who these people are. So you don't know who they are. Yeah, so that part, you know, potentially, I don't know if that's good or bad, but partially uh, open. Yeah. <laughs> well, the reviews are fully open, and it's true even for rejected papers. 
You see everything. Yeah, but but so, you said like anybody, I mean anybody in the internet? Anybody in the internet uh, can can review. And you can be, you can, if, if I were to post a review, I could do it anonymously or put my name in it. I don't even need to log in. To you don't even need to be in part of the conference then? No. Well, I mean, it's, it's, there's some advantage that we can see some of the disadvantages that some people control or yeah, various things. Right. Yeah, but, it's, uh, but the area chairs kind of control the, if uh, there's a problem, they can, they can control it. But I, um, but I didn't see any of that as I looked through it. And you can see these are really nice reviews. The reviewers know their reviews are going to be public, yeah. so they do a better job with it. Mm. Um, this is way better than the cosine reviews uh, yeah. that you get. Um, and then after cosine, there's tons of complaints about how reverse reviewers would reject with like almost no explanation or um, oh, they would say like there's not enough detail, things like this, because you only had a two page submission. Yeah. Here it's a, it's a complete paper and you can see, let's see. These are, are there a lot more reviewers here? Or is it, I mean, um, no, it's things, the same number. Of one, one of the things with cosine is a lot of submissions, they have to whittle it down to few. Yeah. Yeah. And so obviously they have to break this down into different groups to review different things and right. they get together. It's the same process here. It's the same process here. There are more submissions here uh, and fewer acceptances percentage wise. Yeah. Than, so that makes the question is how does that, uh, any individual paper review doesn't tell you whether it's going to get in or not because you have to compare it to all the others. And I'm just curious. Yeah. So it's part of the lack of transparency in cosine is you don't really know what the criteria they're using at different times. No, in, in cosine they tell you the criteria. I know, but it's they, like they said it wasn't. You don't get enough detail on it. So. Right, right. Here, what happens is that every there's an area chair that's coordinating a bunch of papers. Yeah. So ultimately, the area chair looks at the so every reviewer gives a review and then gives a rating, and then if there's a ambiguity, the area chair can then decide. So the area chair is seeing a whole bunch of these uh -huh. and can and can make a decision uh, about it. Um, and you can see how long this is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's tons of detail, and here's like an anonymous. Person who said, "Oh, I was really enjoyed your paper, but I'm confused about blah blah blah." And then the, the authors want to respond because the reviewers are seeing this too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a really nice process, I thought. Um, this is a very extensive review process, um, as a res and as in part because of this, people basically treat these main machine learning conferences. If you get an accepted paper, that's like having a peer-reviewed journal paper. In fact. Almost no one in the machine learning paper really thinks much of journal papers anymore. Um, a few, uh, some people still do it, but this is the mark of success. And, mm. you know, so people are rated based on whether they got how many papers they got in iClear or NeurIPS or ICML. Did they actually come out in any kind of publication later, or is it this just, is it. Is it just to go to the conference website and that's yeah. the paper? And, um, but it's considered archival. Uh, yeah. Um, so you can click on it and then get the entire PDF uh, in here. So, what? Openreview.net. Yeah, openreview.net. Um, you know, so you get the whole. If you have questions and you know, as the person is talking, you can look at this thing, um, or later on, uh, you can look at it. So it's very useful. Um, and this is so different from a neuroscience conference where they don't even let you take pictures of the presentation yeah. and the posters. It's so ridiculous because uh, I really like taking the pictures and going back and reviewing it and looking at it. Um, and this here, there was like no stigma against pictures. You can just go and take pictures of the was postcards. Was there posters, posters and talks the same way as other Yeah, there were posters and talks. One nice thing is if you have a talk, you yeah. also have a poster. Mm -hmm. So after your talk, people can come and talk to you in front of the poster, mm -hmm. which is a really nice so topic. Like a it's like a built-in yeah. Q&A. Yeah. Right. Um, and of course, every paper is open access. There's no closed access anywhere in here. Um, um, anyway, I, th I, I think the neuroscience community could learn, and in general, a lot of science discipline, I think, could I learn if they can. This. I mean, I, I'm trying to understand why, why are they different, and um, what, are there systemic reasons for that, or is it more just history, you know? Um, the, the name, for example, one systemic might think if neuroscience companies are dominated by experimental results, that's one of the reasons people don't want to talk about their work because they review their experimental results as like, I've spent years getting this, I'm not going to let anyone else take it. Yeah. Um, um, the same fear could happen here. Um, it's actually easier to steal someone else's experimental results in machine learning than it is in but it, doesn't, it probably doesn't take you two years to get your experimental results here. As, right, so yeah. though I think the, the fear is worse here. 
Because if you were to show something in a conference, in like literally two days, I could copy you and, and have my own version of it. And so the fear should be worse. In, in I don't know, I guess, I guess it's like, I, mean, uh, uh, I, I sort of feel that the opposite. It's sort of like the longer you work on something, the more you might feel possessive of it. And, um, I think there's a lot of work. Maybe not that's you know two three years I mean, I mean, worth. I mean, I mean, uh, this is what I've been heard in the past, not recently, but a long yeah. time ago, like when I was at R and I. Um, I heard this a lot when people would say, you know, I've spent you know five years collecting this data, and I don't really want to share it with anyone because that data is going to last me now. I'm going to use that for the next three years to publish papers. Yeah, and I, I'm not going to tell anyone about it. And so it was more, it had to do with this sort of duration of time they had to work on something like that. The whole process was eight years long, or a year, eight years from now, everything's going to be obsolete. Practice. Yeah, yeah. But um, so I, I think know. there's there's something to the fact that in neuroscience, things that just take longer. And so there's yeah. there uh, that's an issue there. But um, I think another part of the reason is in neuroscience, uh, Nature and science publications are considered kind of the gold standard. Yeah, and those, here those, those, there's no it, here. It's the conference submission. The yeah. conferencing is the gold yeah. standard. Yeah. So people put tons of work into these. The amount of work they put into these submissions is quite amazing, mm -hmm. um, even from a small group. Um, so they spend they they plan their whole year around these conference deadlines, mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, it's all about these deadlines. And it's a it the deadlines have an impact too because. There's a, a submission date and then there's a notification date, and all of this ha stuff happens within those two or three months. So there's all this type of stuff happens within um, those two or three months. So there's all this not like stuff happens years of within those two or three. You, you have it has to be done in two three mm -hmm. months. Uh, and so, so you're so, going to know. You're going to know. Right? Yeah, uh, and if you don't get it, you can try again. But mm -hmm. um, it's all going to happen within the two three months. So there's a pacing to it and a yeah. kind of almost a project management aspect to it that mm -hmm. I think speeds things up and that I don't see why that couldn't be applied. No, so, uh, Whereas in neuroscience often they will say, oh, run this other experiment, run this other experiment. Uh, you know, the reviewers will say yeah. it's another two years and often they're not really that necessary. And we had a conversation this last week with uh, Tony Zador about thinking about starting a conference, which is more- Brain. Oh, you did? Oh, is that it? No, no. no but uh, I don't know if it's public. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, there's some talk about creating a, another conference that uh, that's sort of related to um, mm -hmm. you know this topic, and we should just remember if, they, if that comes about, then maybe to sort of talk about these ideas. Yeah, yeah. I, I tweeted all uh, my impressions on all this, and uh, Tony liked my tweets. So. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so he knows. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm feeling about it. Yeah. <laughs> You're late to the party, John. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm already like, I'm so old school. I didn't get the tweet. Yeah. Um, what else can I say? Uh, but overall, so there's, there's, you know, neuroscience is inherently slower, but there's no reason to make every aspect of the scientific process slower. Yeah. Um, and there's just modern tools and modern ways of doing things. It was nothing like this 10, 20 years ago. Um, and I was, came away really impressed with just the process that yeah. they use. The other thing I think that goes on behind the scenes is that um, reviewers themselves are rated. And um, it's all behind the scenes. There's a, there's a fairly big kind of organizing committee, and they um, uh, and and the better reviewers then become kind of area chairs. And I don't know exactly how that happens, but it's, I, I anonymous. Think, it's anonymous to us, but it's not anonymous to the area chair. Like the area chair knows who this person is. Oh, that makes uh, a big difference. Uh, I, 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 yeah. I didn't know, know that. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. This is all done behind that, the scenes. That's a, the, a very clear way of preventing people trolling. Oh, so that's for the main reviewers, but anyone from the, so just to be clear that there's uh, two, three reviewers Brains. that are assigned to the paper by the area chair, uh, and that's known, and then anyone for the from follow. the world can. I, I randomly them. gifted a so subscription, so you got it. And and uh, most of these um, conferences, not all of them, the submission is uh, also anonymous. Uh, remember, like we had to do yeah. with, uh, uh, I think they, they make, make it, uh, there's a bunch of rules around how you make your submission anonymous. So they don't yeah. really know. Although I feel like, I think in game time. Yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me of the whole process that in my life going through this where, you know, I didn't feel like the normal neuroscience processes would be effective in, in doing neurocortical theory. And, and so the R&I was an attempt to sort of break the rules there. 
And then even when we published um, the CLA white paper, that was sort of an attempt like, hey, well, let's get this out quickly, let's yeah. document it. Um, well, let's not wait for a peer review process. And that didn't work very well. I mean, yeah. it, just didn't, it just didn't work. And right. five years later, we had to go, okay, submission, we give it in, you know, we'll submit it and get a regular publication. Um, so this institution just observed this and yeah. tried to figure out what the hell's going on. Um, and, and the community, I think these things just really help speed speed up science. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of great. great. So I think that was really, really nice. Uh, came away with an interesting, and it was, I think it's since I hadn't really been to a machine learning conference in many years, um, so it's kind of nice to. How many people were there? Um, just, uh, not sure. It's reasonable. Yeah, it's, it's not huge. This is cosine size, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe a little bigger than cosine size. Mm. Um, so iClear is one of the newer ones. Um, uh, I've heard NeurIPS nowadays is a lot bigger, um, and CVPR, which is like a vision conference that. I used to go to in the 90s. Now it's apparently it's like 10,000 people go there, which wow. is insane. Um, um, so this is what it looked like. This reminds me of the uh, Apple's 1984 commercial. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, that's a brain <laughs> model. <laughs> yeah, he's exactly. It's just like this picture. All the drums in the background. Like, well, right. Same one. Well, big enough, they need a second big screen to yeah, they had a bunch of screens. Oh, that's the other thing uh, I forgot to mention. All the talks are live streamed and recorded. So mm -hmm. you can go back and look mm -hmm. at them. So you don't have to be at the conference. You have to be registered. No, anyone can um, mm -hmm. watch it. And it's recorded for, you know, yeah. for later too. Wow, that's great. Um, and this is true even for the workshops. Huh. Uh, so even the workshop sessions, um, the, at least the one I went to was was live stream, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so they're pretty organized. They're, they're really organized about this stuff. Right. Um, nice. So if you can't go to the conference, that's fine too. Uh, this is the poster session. Lots of room between them. All. Yeah, there's it's a lot. Room. You remember the cosine? Yeah, there's a whole highways are like so grand. Yeah, this <laughs> is a lot more room. <laughs> Three times as much that may be kind of a budget thing. So they, this was in the New Orleans Convention Center, which is a massive yeah. place, and yeah. the conference just took up a part of it. But they just the rooms were just much bigger, yeah. as, as opposed to being in a hotel. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see if I can do this full screen. Okay. Um, there was a really nice um, talk by. Oops. That. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, what was it? Sorry. What was her name? Emily Schupberg on uh, machine learning and uh, climate change and what machine learning could do to help climate change. And she talked about, um, you know, sort of organizing all of the data that's available today and just being able to do analysis on that. And they have tons of incredible amounts of data available and no ability right now to really analyze this stuff. Um, and then, uh, um, what was the three, she had like three things that, that could be done now. One is to just uh, analyze the current data, then use the data to show how effects currently can be mitigated. Because there's lots of effects like flooding going on and oh. some cities are much more, um, uh, susceptible to it than others. And we said that global temperature uh, charts are very reliable and they have, they have that in hand, but the local ones, there's huge variations. And so what happened in San Francisco is very different from what happened in Bangladesh or yeah. um, Africa and stuff. And those models are like very unreliable right now. And I think that this is one of the themes of climate change is that there's winners and losers. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. And there's places, I guess, Qatar and places where it's like 140 degrees now and people are dying. And they're yeah. Not inevitable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but just they don't even understand it right yeah. now. But, and if you can understand it, then you could mitigate it perhaps. So that's okay. like, um, and then the third part is just how do we prevent, you know, forecasting? And if we did this change, what would be the effect? Mm -hmm. If we did that change, what would be the effect? Um, and oh, why isn't this? Sorry. Yeah. Go back to this for you. Yeah, 
uh, and then um, she just listed some of the kind of machine learning challenges. And it's interesting that some of those challenges are tied to the stuff we've done with the uh, with HTMs. Like um, a lot of the typical machine learning algorithms assume IID data, IID and stationary data, whereas a lot of this stuff is streaming data, and, and uh, they need to build predictive models of stuff. Um, <laughs> searching Sorry, gears. Going from the, the, end of, the end of humanity to, <laughs> to, to music. Um, I couldn't tell if this was a good talk or not. <laughs> In the sense that, this, so this is a talk by DeepMind, and what they've done uh, is they were looking at generating music where you take care of all of the time scales. The music has time scales that's in the uh, level of milliseconds that you have to worry about, but also at the level of minutes, which is the structure of the whole piece. And then seconds is in, in between. So you, they, they built a model that can take care of, uh, that can model all of those different time scales. And then what they did is um, they've created this huge data set. Um, with, uh, they put like nine years of work into this. They're, they ran, uh, comp there's a this is cool. music competition that's going on for years. Heard about this Where you have uh, virtuoso piano players playing different pieces. Um, and what they did is they lined up the actual notes on the, on the, uh, on the page with um, the notes that are pressed by the player down to millisecond level precision. Um, and the... Uh, what is the competition? What is it about? Uh, the competition was some other. Um, it's not a deep mind competition. It was some other competition. I, mean, I don't even know what it is. It's right? just a, a piano playing competition. Just, just like, like reading the music and play the piano. Uh, it's just like yeah, uh, but it's, like, it's not. It's not blind. It's not. Uh, it's not blind reading or sight reading. It's uh -huh. these are uh, best performers. Uh, in the world coming and then you compete to see who plays the best, I think. Uh, so it's just per it's it, like performance. It's performance settings. Yeah. So these are very nuanced differences, you're saying. Yeah, but they're all like experts. I mean, you have all of this, like you have this, uh, you I'm know. So, I'm still yeah. confused like this. If I have, a, I have the music, I could rarely play the music as it's written. That's pretty simple, right? Yeah, but it's all about the expressivity. Yeah. If you play, uh, yeah. you know, I don't know, Chopin's. Uh, yeah piece then yeah. you two people one that there's um, very large differences in expressivity yeah, between, yeah. depending on the how well you play it's not a Turing test it's just how well you play it, it but that's, these are all humans playing it all humans so the no I'm just saying how the data set was collected oh, so this is just oh, a data set oh, so oh. okay so so I the, thought it was like some AI systems were playing the piano like, what's the no that's what they want to do so uh, what they're collecting a data set first because what happens is if you just have a MIDI piece or yeah. you know, and you and you synthesize that into music it just sounds yeah, very I, plain. I, I got it. Uh, whereas if you have a human playing it it's very uh, yeah. expressive. And so they want to have uh, AI be able to play music that's ex expressive as the best piano player. It seems like a very kind of false goal in some sense. It's like you know first of all let's say there's an emotional content to the music and. It's very, very subjective to between personal experiences and your history, and um, so it's sort of get, it's like a Turing test in some sense that the the past is you have to be like a human in a very subtle way, um, but that necessarily there isn't any absolute way that's better or different. You well, know? you can compare it against existing music synthesis, which is horrible. I, I got it, but the, uh, the, the so goal is that you're trying to. You you're trying to you're trying to create an artistic expression thing, you know. Uh, whereas, is that the goal of AI to, to be like that? Or is the goal of AI to, uh, it just seems like a false, it's an interesting, but it's not a very useful end goal. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff in AI today about synthesizing stuff, uh, images and yeah. videos and um, even artistic, a lot of artistic images, yeah. imagery and stuff. I understand so. that, but it's, I always felt that that's, it's sort of skirting the whole issue of what intelligence is. And, yeah, great. Right. Right? It's, it's, it gets around to sort of like, let's be as much like a human as we can possibly be. And we're now into the subtleties of these emotional nuances of things. But right. is, is that really right. what intelligence is about? Yeah, I don't think so. It's like, no, but it's a part of what machine learning can do. I know. Which is a different I, question. I just, but I feel like it's just like I always felt the Turing test was a very, uh, a, a negative thing. It brings you in the wrong direction. Yeah. In the wrong direction. It's like, it's not that it's not interesting. 
and maybe we want machines that can talk to music, and maybe we want machines that can talk to you, and I mean, that's a nice thing, but it's not the core of what AI is, or what right. intelligence is. Yeah. And this, that's what I'm arguing. Um, but here's an example. Um, so this is played by a real human. <laughs> so you kind of see how expressive it is. And then I think this is like a typical synthesizer piece. So it sounds a lot flatter. And then this is uh, theirs. It's also volume. Yeah, I, I noticed that. I noticed that. Uh, that's really misleading. Yeah. I mean, I guess a lot of people yeah, these are not. Uh, if I could just say this that well, I'd be pretty happy. Yeah, be careful. There's a difference in, uh, in, in the tone. tone and, yeah. And, yeah. I think the tone is part of it, like making just, it's just it just sounds rich. richer. The richer, I mean, it, it, it's almost like the individual notes are going to be more accurate on the piano. Than, you know, than yeah. It just feels that way. It, yeah. sounded, it sounded like it was less, it wasn't just about the expressiveness, it also felt like it had some. Yes, and they actually made a point of noting that, that it's, so part of it is just the timing and the, yeah. all that, but it's also the, the way they're generating it, it sounds like a concert hall because it was, all yeah this, this system was trained in concert hall so it actually it picked up on those so that you know you can take yeah. it as it is so. yeah. um but anyway they, there's you know, they details do, they of take one of those yamaha pianos that are completely programmable and so you could then you should take your your i don't know this would even work you want to like have you know a human play that piano and then the software play that piano right. at the yeah. same time <laughs> and then you can comparing apples to apples you know yeah so they basically the way they did, they came up with a intermediate representation that captures all that stuff by training it on this massive data set, mm -hmm. uh, and but and that data set is all available. Um, maestro, uh, they call it maestro, yeah. um, but it doesn't really generate new pieces as such. As far as I could tell, it's yeah. it's mostly an intermediate representation. You can kind of seed it with some stuff, and it, it does do a little bit of generation, but it's mostly like given this intermediate representation, play something realistic. Yeah. And you can play it at different styles, I think. But um, but it's not, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I'm not, I don't think it's really generating, it's not composing music. So what, are you using sort of standard convolutional neural networks, and then how are they tweaking them? What is the uh, process by which, how much customization goes into this? Yeah, this uses something called transformer networks. Um, and and it's the hot new thing we can do another session on it but they have that they have like an attentional system that pays attention to different time scales in the past and it's been yeah. used for language modeling uh -huh. uh, it's very it's very successful for language generation yeah. and language understanding and they're using that idea here i mean uh, i'm writing you know, I'm, I'm trying to write that chapter and finish it but i regret sending it out to you earlier um, but you know, this is a key point of the chapter: is how much of this stuff is generalizable today, or you know, how much customization goes into these solutions. And so the fact we're picking different networks to solve different problems is yeah. definitely it's, it's huge customization yeah. thing. And then yeah. uh, outside of the training itself, um, yeah, I mean, what is the structure? What are the things they have to put around it? What other inputs and outputs you have to create? You know, right? Yeah. You so know, there's a lot of custom networks for different. Yeah, I mean, if you think like you know, this, so DeepMind has done the Go playing computer, and now they've done this piano playing question is could piano playing play go and go play the piano and it sounds probably not it's not even close it sounds like it would be yeah the network structures are quite different yeah and okay um this is one of the few neuroscience talks so this is from uh it, it's a uh, it's sort of one small result but it's it's kind of interesting um it's from surya ganguly's lab uh -huh. and uh they are trying to explain this fact that if you look at primates and their retinas, uh -huh. the response responses of these ganglion cells are very simple, like uh, center surround or like really simple feature extractors, uh -huh. uh, not e really feature extractors. But if you look at the mouse retina, you actually have oriented, uh, you know, edge detection and uh -huh. stuff like that going on in the mouse retina. And so, why is that? Um, how, why is the mouse retina more sophisticated than the primate retina? <laughs> um, and
And so their their answer. I have a guess, but I mean, this is do, do, do they have a definitive way of testing this answer? Or so they, they tested it with convolutional network. Uh -huh. so uh, I give this a convolutional network, and what happens? Yeah, but they, they, they trained convolutional networks and then they looked at the first few layers in two different scenarios mm -hmm. and they they get edges in one scenario and, and no edges in the other scenario. What's the so, difference in the scenario? Yeah, so this difference let me see if I have a, So they're actually picture. trying to use the convolutional neural network to model the retina then? Yeah, so assume you have pixels coming in uh -huh. and then you have some simulated retina and this a simulated brain mm -hmm. using convolutional neural networks. What they did is that um, first, there's from the retina. There's a uh, you have to go through the optic fiber, yeah. uh, and so there's a bottleneck there. Yeah. So there's many more um, pixels in your retina yeah. than there are fibers in the optic nerve, and so there's a bottleneck. And then the neocortex for primates is much more sophisticated than for for mice. Well, we know the mice basically only have a V1. Yeah, uh, have a V2. you know, and this kind of a V2, but. Uh, not much. So that was so there. They had two different systems. One which had a a big, quote unquote, neocortex, and another one which had very few uh, convolutional networks. And then they trained it on things like ImageNet and stuff. And so and sure enough, they found that if you have a big convolutional network, you you get like no feature detectors here. And if you have a small one, you do end up with feature detectors here. And the the basic Everybody point just joining us, is uh... that. With the mic, with the mouse, you meant a research uh, meeting. You, you actually going lose over a lot of information from out of the ICL retina because you do these so you just got back from. But in the primate neocortex, you retain a lot more of the complexity, yeah. and so that you can actually do more stuff. Yeah. Well, that way, interpret it's pretty simple. Maybe this is wrong. Is you just say, you know, I'm going to divide this problem across the retina and the cortex, and, um, and so I'm trying to optimize some solution. Well, if the if the retina is, plays a, a smaller role in the whole system, then yeah. there's less specialization that's going to occur in that, and, and right. you're going to spread the problem and solution over multiple uh, layers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and but in, in and also this, but this idea that this is something that's being trained, but I don't know if anyone believes that this stuff is learned in the brain. I mean, no, the, but they said it, it's learned through evolution. Yeah, yeah it's adapted. Right. So why would evolution do this in the mouse and, yeah. and not in the macaque? Yeah. So that was their thing. I thought it was a, you know, it's it's not trying to solve all of intelligence, yeah. but it, it, I thought it would, I believe this answer. It seems yeah. makes sense. And yeah. um, and it means the primate neocortex can do a lot more with the visual system than sure. mice can. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, so that was one of the few kind of almost pure neuroscience what is it? Uh, I don't know if I want to go into this right now. Um, yeah, this is. Um, there are a couple of posters like this. I didn't really go into it in detail, but it was. I would point it as the machine learning take on this location based idea. So, what they're doing here is uh, they train a system to look at shapes and convert it into a program, literally source code, that can generate that shape. They're using okay. a neural network to do this. They're using a neural network to do this. And I have not read the papers yet. So you can see here that uh, when you get a, a, maybe it's this shape, I'm not sure, but it, you basically get these loops that sh say, okay, draw a line from this location to that location, draw a line from this are location you, to that showing, location. Are they training on uh, <laughs> different images on this object? Yeah. yeah. So they, they rotate the object. Uh, that I'm, uh, I, I'm not 100% sure. I have to read the papers. I didn't get a chance to talk to them. Uh, um, wow. So, <laughs> so it's sure. a location-based representation of shapes. Uh, <laughs> That's really weird. <laughs> That's a really <laughs> weird way to do it. Hey, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're to generate the code that can represent this thing. Yeah, well, guess who the co author is? Oh, gosh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. <laughs> that is really funny. Wow. Um, <laughs> we're right all along. Yeah, well, whoever's listening on the live stream, I'm sorry. sorry about that. <laughs> but this is some old school people on the, on the co author oh, list. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe they're. Knew something back then. Yeah. Uh, this is another one like that, also from MIT. I, I guess it's the same co authors now. Yeah. That I see. Yeah, it's another variant of this. Did they have an explicit, they must have had explicit representation of reference for animal locations? This, I, I need to look at the, uh, I don't know if they really, well, but, but if it's, 
a program implicitly has a reference frame because it's all relative yeah, to one another. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So but whether the object, it's not whether, relative well, to it's the object. Whether it's relative to the object. That was the, the question about are you rotating the object or not. You're just saying here's a picture, and I'm trying to figure out how to draw that picture, but I can't say now draw the same picture in 90 degrees rotated, then right, the right. reference frame may be an egocentric reference frame. And then, right. Um, but they're at least handling the displacement. It, yeah. you know, it's not in the retinal uh, uh, reference frame. Um, uh, Ian Goodfellow gave an invited talk. So he's the uh, person who came up with adversarial networks and generative adversarial networks. Uh, so he gave kind of a, it's, it's a topic that's kind of consumed a good part of the machine learning community now. So he gave a nice talk showing how GANs and adversarial systems are used in a lot of different areas. And this is space image so, generation? So it, this, so it can be used in lots of things. Yeah, this this is uh, showing how the quality of face generation yeah. through these systems has improved. So this is his first paper. This is the quality. And he said it was actually lower resolution than this. He had, uh, he just blew it up for the slide. And today, the, the best systems are actually much higher resolution than this. He had to reduce it for the slide. So now, nowadays, you can generate extremely rich detailed representations of faces. And so it's, this is a, it's a totally made up face. It's a completely, none of these people actually exist. So, um, I, I, you know, my, photo, my, my, my picture doesn't quite capture it, but this is like a remarkably realistic no, I'm picture. Sure. Yeah. Well, I was, you know, you're trying to get the yellowing of the teeth and then, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, the same thing with, so this was for faces and then what they've, uh, similar thing now with ImageNet, you can pick one of the thousands of one of the thousand categories and then generate new instances of this. Uh, so in the beginning, a couple of years ago, there are generated flowers and the structure is not quite right. There you can see there's mistakes. It doesn't really look exactly like a flower. Mm -hmm. And now you get like, this really rich looking uh, it's it's a little yeah the slide is not exactly lined up correctly so I think this must have been examples from this paper it's and creepy. These examples super from this creepy paper. but you videos. can see here like the dog is not quite not yeah right. this one's messed up but this is like really good oh. yeah and they had so so this is with images what I don't have here is they show this with videos um, where you can generate videos that are very realistic and you yeah. can also do things like you can videotape uh, you have a video of a professional dancer mm -hmm. and now you can make a regular person dance the way the professional dancer yeah. dances so that was a, a funny so video what is the, um and how do you, i'm a very high level block question about this you know i'm trying to like i'm trying to figure out in the, in the spectrum of ai and machine learning and technology you know how do i view something like this um i, I don't think of this as ai i don't think of this as intelligence i think this is some sort of um, I don't know what to call it. It's, yeah. a, it's not even machine. It's, I guess you could call it machine learning. It's not machine learning, yeah. But but it's learning to achieve a a very a very specific sort of goal, which I don't consider sort of like AI. It's like I'm right. not sure what to make it. Well, I mean, what what should I call this? Uh, it, there, there's a spectrum of tasks that people are doing, yeah. and this this task doesn't easily fit into. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's not useful. I mean, it may be very useful. But well, but yeah, what about and, and these it? machine learning conferences. Not everyone is interested in AI. No. Uh, they're just interested in using learning-based techniques for doing different tasks. But I think, it's, so this, I think uh, it's helpful to. Um, I, I can tell you from a, where this fits in kind of the space of different types of, I guess, machine learning categories, if yeah. you will. This is all about learning the the probability of of the a space. Yeah. The, uh, and this is about basically learning the distribution of possible images. Yeah, and if I, said, I'm, and, if and I just to broaden out a little bit, say I'm trying to learn the you know the distribution of possible structure in the world, then that might be true AI. You know, it's like uh, I'm trying to. But if I say just a set of images, and I'm really down to some sort of smaller category yeah. here. No, they they can learn um, certain types of structure, like they can learn uh, styles of images. So you can yeah. I just take a photograph and draw it as Van Gogh. Yeah. Like, I, I guess it, so it's not AI, I but it's it's learning the it, it's learning the distribution of what I guess possible say, in the world. I guess if you look at the popular um, uh, descriptions of AI, um, these things are all 
melded together. They're not yeah. clearly differentiated. Yeah. And um, and I think it's confusing to people. Uh, you know, I'm trying to write about this right now. And so, you know, how, how do you describe this kind of stuff that people from the outside and the inside would all sort of agree, like, oh, that's correct or not? But so it's just a very, I mean, today so there's, no popular, there's no popular notion of how this, most people wouldn't be thinking, oh, how's this different than other types? They, they say, oh, there's something that I can do this. I know, therefore, it must be AI. You know, right. it's a capability that I have, so somehow it's AI-like. But humans can't do this at all. A, right, a, right. a, I can't draw paintings and pick, make pictures that look realistic right. of anything unless you're a really good artist. And B, you know, I don't know what's, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's not really intelligent in any way, but it's, it's, a way of statistically capturing I, some of the. I got I, I'm trying to fair. Yeah, I, think, I, 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 I see your confusion. The, I'm not even confused. I, 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 no, no, I, don't, I, I see how people. Yeah, I, I think, it I think we confused. need right. a language which which makes clear these distinctions because without these distinctions, you get a lot of misconceptions and a lot of you know. Can't we just keep calling it weak, weak AI? All this is weak AI. But, but I, is it even AI I don't in any think, way? Yeah, I don't think it's any AI at all. It's not. Well, it's no. Everybody calls it AI. It's not like. Well, How, everybody calls it AI. We can't just attach from that term. Well, no, but she's not everybody. Super Tide was not. Super was making the distinction. I think the people at this conference probably would not say this is AI. They'd probably say it's machine learning, and they'd probably, probably say what you just said. Yeah, it's it's modeling the distribution of yeah. the samples. So I, I don't know, Matt. I don't know if everyone. I mean, everyone like in the broader world might call it AI because they don't have this distinction. Now this it, it might get even more confusing because that you can use this these techniques to make AI systems better. Yeah. So that gets even more confusing. <laughs> but it, because this is a very powerful technique, um, it, it can this uh, they're solving a really hard problem here. Yeah. Although I, I unfortunately I think that the the main uses for this problem are nefarious and bad. Um, <laughs> I mean, really fake yeah, fake, fake, fake images. I yeah. uh, no longer you can no longer trust anything you see. Yeah. There are companies now being formed to exploit uh, or, or to productize fake, fake yeah. videos and fake audio, and yeah. stuff. you will not be able to. So, and, and, and I think that's just going to you just we just have to all accept that. I know but it's going to take a while before the general populace understands this. Yeah. And in, in the meantime, you're going to find all these bad things are going to happen. From this. Right. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do this or not. I'm just pointing out that this is a this is an application which has more probably more negative applications than positive ones and. Um, and it's also confusing in terms of what's AI. Yeah. And yeah. Are, uh, you know, again, I'm trying to I'm trying to write about this right now, and I don't want to piss off people and you know and have people complain. I need some some language in which to describe these things that, that, yeah. that sort of makes sense. So it's a pretty sophisticated statistical tool, yeah. and um, I think Ian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this was basically the outline of his talk. So he mm -hmm. went through how adversarial networks have affected lots of different applications of a machine learning. This is not an adversarial network, this is machine learning in general. No, no, the, but this is how, so he went through every single topic here and showed how adversarial networks uh, and adversarial systems has improved those areas. Oh, I see. Yeah. But, but these in some sense were sort of like, these are different, uh, oh, these are different applications. These are different applications. So you could put AI here, because I think this is a very general tool yeah. that could help you know, uh, traditional yeah. AI, yeah. Um, but things like security, you wouldn't call that AI. It's well, yeah, it's confusing. It's confusing. It comes out of some AI company that call it AI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's confusing. <laughs> yeah. um, there's been some interesting work in neuroscience applications of adversarial networks in neuroscience that just came out, I think, a couple of weeks ago, where they're trying to figure out. So the idea is, how do you know? what inputs will make a neuron respond, right? It's a very hard problem for neuroscientists, yeah. Uh, yeah. particularly if you're much later in the system. So in the visual system for V4 and IT, they use adversarial networks to sort of probe this thing and figure out exactly what this neuron responds to from an from a, mm. uh, image. So they, they, create, they were able to create images that cause the neuron to respond maximally. So we might want to look at that. It, it's, it's cool. It's cool to see like you, you can find like this optimal image for making a certain neuron in a monkey fire. And yeah. It's like creepy and it's weird. And so, you can actually so and what do you learn from this? Again, it's a. I, I think you think of this as a technique for doing something. It's not. Yeah. It's a very powerful technique for. 
Well, in so this case, figuring out what a neuron is. So, well, but again, you know, as we know, there's it's all these biases built into that. Like, yeah. Is the animal awake? Yeah, keep in mind, this, this isn't like a big Gabor filter. You can actually like say, hey, that looks like my lab mate. Like, like, I understand. So but it, it's but really the question, what but these are all passive. These are not yeah. an active so behavior. That's system. my point. So yeah. those neurons that are they're measuring these neurons in the brain, typically in a passive system where they're just putting an image, there's no active sensing, there's, right. you know, there's no context. Uh, and then we know neurons behave very, very differently when yeah. the animal's awake and moving about. So you might be just modeling this perfect, you know, sort of uh, uh, receptive field for neuron, but it may be total nonsense in terms of understanding how the brain works. Yeah. Uh, but but that that's true for a lot of neuroscience. I know. And, so I'm just, just saying so you're, advancing, that, you're advancing the part of neuroscience which is I, that I sort of. No, I don't. I think there's a general technique that could be used for behavioral stuff okay. too, uh, because yeah. you can do videos and other stuff. It's just yeah. figuring out what, how to really model what a system responds to. Yeah. That's basically what this. Yeah. Uh, but. I guess maybe I'm trying to answer. Would you, would you would doing this make it more likely you would figure out? Oh, there's reference frames and there's grid cells and there's orientation cells and all these other things. That or I don't it, know. Or yeah. is it just going to more sort of advance the, the, to the paradigm that was established in the '60s? Yeah. Um, you know, like, oh, what does this cell respond to? No, I think I think the experimenter still has to have these hypotheses and theories, but it could make the experiment faster to conduct. Yeah, I guess I'm saying so. That's experiments the, are maybe not the best thing in the world. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. This is kind of a weird symptorial <laughs> versus via symptosin. So, if you if you train a robot on a on a simulated world, you, you find that it doesn't apply well to the real world. So there's various techniques for making that better. But what they did here is they take the real world. And convert it to a simulated image of that real world. So they they take like images of whatever this is, I can't see, but they would it's convert it into things. yeah, it's a box with some things, and they convert it into a simulated version of that. Huh. Um, and and now you can just train the robot on simulated stuff again. And when you deploy it, you take real images, convert it into simulated images, and now the robot works fine. <laughs> 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 and then, so it's basically learning to grasp without any real data, but it works in the real world. I mean, I, I think this is not quite right because there is real data that it's being trained on, but anyway. Yeah. So that's just funny. Well, you know, you could argue this is what brains are doing because brain, we don't perceive the real world, right? We perceive our model of right. the world. Yeah. And so uh, we don't really have a picture of the world. All we have is what our brain's model of what thinks, and hmm. and then uh, we train on that. And there is obviously a complete feedback loop through the real world. But if you think about internal into the neocortex, what is it learning on? What are the motor systems learning on? They're not learning about the data coming. From the no, that's so an interesting way to look at it because I think in this case it's it has to create a three D model. Yeah. So it's going from an image to a three D model. Yeah, that's what our brain. Yeah. Is. We, we immediately go through our internal model of the world and everything. And once you're beyond, once you're beyond the first two layers in V1 for vision, for example, you're into you're, you're dealing with the model world. Right. You're not dealing with the real world anymore. Was there a feedback in this? Uh, yeah, so the, then the agent does an action and then that's going to cause the world to change and then you redo it. Uh, My point is if I, were, if I was a human learning to grab something using vision, so I suppose you know, I'm not feeling the object, I'm using vision to direct my hand. We don't do that. We, we do that plus we use our hands, you know, senses. But if I were doing that, the information has to go through the visual system and go over to the somatosensory system and then control the, the limbs. And so the, that's all the training that's occurring there is all on the internal model world. Um, and uh, so, anyway, so it seems similar to, it might be doing something similar to. Yeah. Hmm. So that was kind of a weird thing. Yeah. Um, So is that noise robustness? The bunch of posters on, on noise robustness. And we talk about sparsity. There are a couple of papers on yeah. sparsity, um, but I not much. The one. Hmm? I see the one that I found. Yeah, the pruning one. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple, uh, there are, I don't know if there are many pruning ones, but that was one. Uh, this is there's a benchmark uh, that this 
Dan Hendricks created for robustness. So, so we're adding kind of shot noise to our image, but he created a be benchmark where you add all of these other types of noise mm. for uh, MNIST and CIFAR uh, or CIFAR. What's the difference between Gaussian noise and shot noise? Uh, Gaussian noise, I think, um, perturbs each pixel by some Gaussian amount uh, and, oh, so and more like just a few pixels. Yeah, you choose a, I think so. Okay. And then, then I don't know yeah, what yeah. impulse noise is. Oh, okay. uh, maybe we're doing impulse. I don't know. But anyway, we may want to look at this yeah, and, and create JPEG artifacts and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, so then we can compare. Right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And he has a bunch of results on this. So. So that would be nice. Yeah. It's a good yeah. benchmark um, for us to work on. This is another one uh, on robustness. Yeah. Maybe I won't go into it in detail right now. Oh, and this was for Chrissy. Oh, she, she's, <laughs> meeting. Uh, huh? she's meeting in the she's other room. Oh, OK. I can show her later. Um, <laughs> Every parent should have this chart. Is that exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I thought this was a really nice talk. By this guy Pierre Yves Udier. So he comes at things from more of a he's a roboticist, but he comes at it from a cognitive science uh -huh. background. And he's you know saying we shouldn't really train on end-to-end -end tasks. We should train on we should recognize how people learn gradually through moving around in the world and learning about the world and stuff. And so all our robots should be learned that way, and then eventually you learn the tasks. Uh -huh. And um, this is a chart about all the different not all, the, but a whole bunch of stages of development and what kids exactly. learn at Chris, different. Because Chris, Chris was just last week talking about, you know, uh, let's see rolling. That was a big thing. So there we go. It's like in the first, <laughs> it's like three Yeah, months, she's still months. in here. Yeah. Uh, well, there's, a, you know, rolls, dolly the back. And yeah. And he showed a really funny video of a baby in a room, a time lapse video, and what the baby does. And instead of going all over the place and uh, just exploring everything. So he had, uh, I don't know if I have pictures of that. Uh, yeah, he had this, um, this idea is that the, what, so the question is, what should you learn? What should you try to learn about? What, sh how should you be curious about stuff? Try to learn how to pronounce that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so his, the basic theory is this thing of, called optimal flow, uh -huh. which is that you don't go towards things that are too hard and you don't want to go things that are too easy. You just want to get, and that, be the model there. Yeah, he's been the, around for a long time. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Decades. Yeah, and he didn't claim it. Yeah, he's, he's, he he didn't claim it that he came up with it. Oh, I uh, but he has a, some. Season, yeah, season. maybe even before yeah. that. And I think a lot of teachers do this naturally. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And well, it's like, also it also plays into the whole dopamine theory about mm -hmm. about you always want to be stretching a little bit, but not too much. Yeah. Uh, so he's kind of formalized that, in, and he showed a bunch of examples of robots learning about their world and how they sort of learn gradually and then become more and more sophisticated rather than the current approach which is just train end to end on a particular task and that's all you worry about yeah. uh, so this is so he had, he had some really nice videos and so that this requires that there's this kind of meta model of you have to figure out okay is this task something that i should try Brains. basically and he's very much into the sensory motor model thank you for the follow Surendra. This is kind of a more formal way of thinking about it. So if you, if this is like your training time, a task four, is, and this is error, task four is one that's really easy and you're just going to be really good at it. And task one is one that's really hard that no matter how much time you spend on it in the near term, you're not going to get better. And these two tasks are ones that you could learn. And so he looks at kind of how fast this gradient is changing and uses that as a way to and switch to another task. And so what you'll actually end up doing is spending That's time on task three for a while. And then when you get pretty good at it, then you'll switch automatically to task two and one, and you're not really going to spend time on one and four. Yeah. And, and what was, uh, I don't have this here, but uh, what was nice is that he actually now has applied this to educational uh -huh. things and creating automated ways of teaching kids math and stuff like that. Um, and so they would, you you watch a per, a kid going through exercises and then suggest new ones based on this idea. Um, and he said the other big thing is you never tell them give them one thing you always give them multiple and let them choose. 
because then they can figure out for themselves which, the, is the, which is the first one to do which is the yeah one. and and when they have the ability to choose they get a lot more motivated mm. and uh as opposed they, to they, they internally they know what where they are on that curve yeah yeah uh, better than the any teacher would know yeah and, and kids will be different each kid will be different yeah. and uh, then you don't get bored of math or yeah. uh, you get so i thought that was really nice and he said that doing that is better than an expert teacher uh, mm -hmm. teaching the kids because there's no way the teacher is going to know all the details about this person yeah. um, so yeah. i thought that was that was yeah. pretty cool he's a little bit of a flashy speaker but it was it was a good talk i just took a picture of this because i thought this is a really I cool picture <laughs> very good i love it i don't know how that's they did poster? it that's a poster and it literally looked like you had done it with chalk on there and i don't know if there's a special font or it is what? Just, what? It's it's just, a font it, it is a font, font. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 it's been really cute about like this the way this line is drawn uh, you know okay, crossing so there's, the there's, y there's a system that does this whole thing Maybe it's a again that does it. Again, <laughs> takes a yeah, regular yeah, closer yeah, yeah. conversion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Because he definitely didn't put those uh, QR codes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is a really cute way of, of doing it. Very cute. I like that. Uh, this is again goes back to the openness of everything. Um, so many people had QR codes. He's got a website yeah, on this, yeah. code for this. All the slides are available. It's an archive paper. Yeah. Everything's there. You want to find out about this technique? Go for it. No. It's just wait till next year. Half the posters are going to look. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> this got so. I'm sure this got so much attention because it looked like this. Maybe, yeah. yeah. There were other cute things too, and there was a. There were a couple of people who like dressed. They had a cute title. I think one was had to do with. Um, what is it with the straw man and the what is that uh, tail in Kansas? So oh, I can't Wizard, Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz, yeah. <laughs> so they were all dressed up as characters of Wizard of Oz at the poster. You know, you talk about the difference between the conferences, right? You yeah. go to a business conference, that kind of stuff. All no, no. Plus, you know, they have oh, people yeah. in costumes, giving away things, <laughs> sure. you know, so maybe it's machine learning conference, it's going to become the same thing, you know. You know how to... um, so anyway, I thought that was... This is a... And I think the card tricks getting in once. This one I'll need to spend a little bit more time on. This is... Uh, posted by Tom Mico Thomas McConey. If you remember, he was a yeah. uh, visiting scientist here for a few months. Oh my God. Uh, he's uh, now at Uber. French, right? <laughs> huh? French? French, yeah. yeah. Uh, and this was maybe the only example of using neuroscience to improve deep learning that I saw. Maybe one other one. But uh, his, and it's a very simple technique of applying a kind of dynamic plasticity to weights um, motivated by, I think, how. Dopamine or some neuromodulation. What, is, what kind of AI lab does Uber have? This seems very, um, I would have thought it might have been very applied to their problem. Yeah, I asked it just him. It doesn't seem that way. Yeah, I asked him about it. He said there were, um, this is work he had started before he got oh, there. I see. But these are Uber people involved and they've been supportive of it. Well, I'm so. just wondering if, if this is sort of an odd thing that he brought in with him where they have a basic research group here that does basic research. I mean, I, I had yeah. the impression that the research thing was more oriented towards, you know, Uber problems. No, I think that's it's slightly broader. Than that. Uh -huh. So this was, I mean, it's good that they let him do this. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, actually, it's sort of the, the let him do it is sort of indicative of it. Like, yeah. it's just, you know, some places that no, it's pure research group. You can do whatever you want, or like, okay, you can work on that on a part time because you already started. Or yeah. It's also impressive that he was able to recruit three other Uber people to work with him on this. Yeah. Well, maybe they're all tired of doing <laughs> better ways of delivering Uber Eats, you know, yeah. whatever it is. Um, I had a hard time understanding exact, kind of intuitively exactly what's going on here, even though the, the equations are really simple, um, but sort of intuitively what's going on. But uh, I, I might want to take a look at the paper. Again, of course, the paper is available. But, um, oh. Yeah, so that was my oh, last again. back prop. Thanks for that summary. It's funny. Jeff Glenn um, was on. Another nice thing was. Um, there's a, a couple of conferences have done this, but they have a, a conference app yeah. um, called, there's a company called Wolva. I, think. I saw that in the first um, slide. Yeah. So uh, basically everyone signs up for that and then it, there's a social media. Kind Most of companies have that now. Don't yeah, they? but this one, it was very active and I met tons of people through it. Oh. Uh, it was very good. Oh. Um, I think they had it in the Dendrites conference too, but people hardly used it. Yeah, um, been, I've seen that elsewhere. I've never used it, but yeah, 
but here it was really good. So like someone created a, I think I created a Eric subject interest called neuroscience and then someone created a chat called neuroscience and AI. And then we had several meetings, like, huh. like, there were several meetings along that line. So, so how many people would come to those meetings? Like, like 10? Yeah. yeah. It was pretty active. That's good. So, um, this is, this, how, did you run into people who were even aware that what we do in, um, in Yeah, several people had heard of Numenta. I mean, yeah. definitely in the in this neuroscience crowd. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, and a few other people had heard about it. Too. I mean, I have the general mm -hmm. question, if you go to the neuroscience world, a majority of people know who we are and so on, but, um, but um, I would be surprised if, I, mean, I don't know, I had no idea. How many people, I guess it, should, it would probably reflect how many people are thinking about neuroscience. If you're not thinking about neuroscience, you probably wouldn't know much about it. Okay, that's nice. Yeah. Marcus, you're going to do your thing? Oh, uh, yeah. Can I take a quick yeah, final break? Yeah, two-minute break. Sure. Sure. Gives me time, though, so. Yeah. Marcus, I made you presenter. Okay. Are you still on the non-USB-C system? Okay, I'm, we're going to take a quick break. Oh, oh, oh. Obviously. <laughs> I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back. Ooh. Hello. Ah, not muted. I'm back. Okay. Uh, I'm only going to be showing something on my screen for a few minutes of this. Uh, most of it's going to be whiteboard. I don't know if um, if I should o I don't know if it if I should stop sharing my screen for now until I need to, or if um, I don't know if you have a. Uh, Here, I'll, I'll just I'll, stop. I'll I'll pause my sharing for now. Okay, do whatever, uh, you, do whatever is easy. I can cool. catch up. Okay. Okay, that wasn't a paper SJ, that was a 
a talk at a conference, okay. uh, IL, yeah, I ICLR 2019 well, conference. We're all here.